You're asking a man to risk his life for a hundred dollar bet. I'll stake him. If you make it a thousand dollars, even money. Have gun. Will travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875. The Carlton Hotel. Headquarters of a man called Paladin. Hand me those shirts, will you, hey boy, please? Oh, okay. Here. You know, Mr. Paladin, it looks very bad for a hey boy if anyone see you do your own packing. <laughs> it's not correct for a gentleman to do his own packing. Besides, you're doing stinky job. Oh, for heaven's sake, hey boy, stop your grumbling. Anyway, I'm almost finished now. Good. Oh, there is something you can do for me, though. Oh, what that? Fix me another whiskey and water. Oh, yes, sir. This is a pretty far trip you take, Salamanca. Salamander, hey boy. No, it's not too far. Oh, where are here, uh, Salamanca? Probably when you were eavesdropping on my business conversation. Oh, no, sir, not eavesdropping. Just uh, interested. Yes, you drink. Thanks. Where is this Salamanca? Well, there's a city called that in Mexico, and one in Spain, I think, and uh, there's another one somewhere in South America. South America? Like I say, long trip. And like I say, I'm not going to Salamanca, hey boy. I'm going to Salamander City, California. And when I get there, I've got to You've see... You've got to uh, find a girl named Irene. Right, right, yeah. It seemed that this Irene... Was in circus and quit and go to work in saloon because there's a fella in town she loved very much and is going to marry up with and her father don't want her to do this and he's going to pay you a thousand dollar to bring her back to San Francisco and you say, okay, or say, you say, you go. <laughs> it's amazing how much you can hear while you mix drinks. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you very much. All the Chang family have very strong ears. You go now? I go. <laughs> With our American servicemen in many countries around the world, they have a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions. What might have seemed strange before is becoming pretty familiar to them. For instance, among the Mohammedans, to drink coffee with anybody is regarded as a sacred rule of hospitality, a token of peace. The berries are roasted over a charcoal fire, and the coffee is allowed to boil three times. It's thickly sugared and served in very small cups. All this is traditional among the Mohammedans, but as our servicemen have observed, it's, well, it's simply their version of our mid-morning coffee break or our afternoon tea party or our cocktail hour. It's a time for friends to sit down and relax. It's a time for conversation with a cup of whatever beverage suits the individual taste. And this is true of customs and traditions of all countries. A way of doing things may be different, but the ideals are the same. So it is by observing these customs but our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill with other people in other lands. It was near sundown when the stage pulled into Salamander City. I got a room at the local hotel and walked across the street to the saloon to get a drink and perhaps some information about Irene Stanford. The Salamander Saloon was like any hundred of its brothers, the barkeep with his celluloid collar and derby hat, the ever-present painting of the lightly clad young lady with a rose in her hair. The mixture of cowboys, farmers, and townspeople trying to forget the toils of a day's work with beer or rye whiskey. Their heads were all turned to one side of the room where a little man was performing acrobatic tricks much to their amusement and appreciation. I found elbow room at the bar beside an attractive young lady who obviously worked for the house. You buying drinks for anyone, mister? Yeah, I might be. I drink rye. That's a good drink. Barkeep, two glasses of rye. Yes, sir. Coming up. Hey, who is the acrobat? Dooley Delaware. Mm, very good. He's the best. Used to be with Barnum. You're new here. What brings you into Salamander? I'm looking for a girl called Irene Stanford. Oh? What's your name? Paladin. You're from San Francisco? That's right. I might have known. Here you are. Two rides. Thank you. What do you want with Irene? Oh, a personal matter. Do you know her? 
Well, I can tell you this much. She's trying to make her own way, and she doesn't want you or anybody else sticking their nose into her business. You seem to know her pretty well. Well enough. Oh, how, how is that, Rena? Did you see me twist into that handspring? I sure did. Dooley was perfect. My knee's getting stronger and stronger. It won't be long. Dooley, this is Mr. Paladin. Dooley, Delaware. Well, how are you? How are you? Mr. Paladin's from San Francisco. Oh, <laughs> Oh, here, Rena. Hold this money for me. Sure, honey. It should be over a dollar there. <laughs> Everybody seems to be more generous tonight than usual. <laughs> I think I'll go back and see if I can make some more. Oh, uh, glad I met you, Mr. Powell. Yes, glad to met you, Dooley. I'll be right here at the bar, Dooley. Hey, nice little fellow. Must be a good friend of yours. The only friend I've got in this town. Set him up, barkeep. Well, hello, Rena. Marquette. See your boy keeping everybody entertained like all this. Guess he thinks if he keeps on practicing, he'll be good enough for the circus someday. He was with the circus before he got his knee oh, hurt. Oh, you believe that story? Bolo, go fetch Dooley over here, will you? Yes, sir. Dooley. Who's he? Marquette. He runs Salamander City. He owns most of the town. He thinks that gives him the right to own everybody in it. Uh-huh. Now, who's that with him? Bolo, his errand boy. Uh, did you want to see me, Mr. Marquette? Yeah, Dooley. How'd you like to make $50? $50? Well, you wouldn't joke me, would you, Mr. Marquette? Well, there's a lot of talk about how good you are. You used to be with Barnum and Big Star in the circus. Well, yes, sir. I might just give you a chance to prove how good you are. Now, this $50 says you can't walk a rope across this here saloon. Now, there's an easy bet for Dooley Delaware, ain't it? Well, I don't have a rope. Bolo. Yes, sir. How's about rigging it up from balcony to balcony? You think you could walk that, Dooley? Well, I, I think I can do it, but I can't meet the bed. I don't have $50. You rig her up, Bolo. Okay, Mr. Marquette. I'm always willing to make arrangements, Dooley. Now, how about if you don't make it, why... You curry my horse and shine up my boots every day for a whole year. No, Dooley, don't do it. What's the matter, Rena? <laughs> you afraid your boy get hurt? It isn't a fair bet. Why don't you let the man speak for himself? What about it, Dooley? Oh, gee, I, I don't know. You a little scared? Well, no, 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 but like Rena says, it ain't a fair bet. You think you can make it, Dooley? I think so. Who are you? Oh, this here's Mr. Paladin. He's from San Francisco. Well, why are you so interested in Dooley, mister? I think you made a raw deal with him. Your bet's one-sided. It's his concern, not yours. If Dooley thinks he can walk that rope from balcony to balcony, then I think he can, too. I'm willing to stake him for the $50. Uh, suit yourself, mister. It's your money. Uh, Mr. Paladin, uh, it could go wrong. Maybe you shouldn't. You could use $50, couldn't you? I sure could. All ready, Mr. Marquette. Well, there she is, Dooley. You gonna do it? Well, uh... All right, it's a bet. Dooley. Now, don't worry, Rena. Even if I fell, it wouldn't be too far to the floor. But I won't fall. You just watch me. Oh, yeah. right. uh, Paladin, I hope you know what you're doing. I think so. I think you just lost yourself $50. We'll see. What do you think, Rena? Well, it's been a long time since he's been on a rope. He's got a bad knee. We sure could use the $50, though. We? We? Dooley and I have got plans, Mr. Paladin. Big plans. All right, Dooley. Show us how you used to do it for Barnum. Yeah, Dooley. Oh, Dooley. Come on, Dooley. Hey, hey, good luck, Mr. Marquette. Here comes the famous Dooley Delaware. Hey. Hey. Paladin, look behind the banister on the balcony. It's Bolo. Dooley, relax for a fall. Dooley. Hey. Oh, look at the rope. Stay here, Rena. You all right, Dooley? Well, I, yeah, I reckon so. Come on, let me help you up. No, thanks. Well, what happened to the rope? Marquette's man used a knife. Oh, well, thanks for warning well, me. Well, Dooley, looks like you lost your bet. You lost $50, Paladin. Mr. Delaware doesn't like to leave a winner on the board, Marquette. He'll repeat the bet, this time double. And your friend Bolo will be down here with the rest of us. Let Dooley call his own bets, mister. I'll cover for Dooley. A hundred dollars, Mr. Marquette. For a hundred dollars? Well, golly, for a hundred dollars, I'd well, I walk Main Street store top to store top. Well, all right, Dooley, the bet is on. 
Somebody tie the rope back up. Who's talking about a rope? Dooley said Main Street, store top to store, top on a wire. Oh, no, wait That's a minute. the bet no. you heard him. My hundred against yours says Dooley can't walk a wire across Main Street from the hotel to the saloon. Oh, Mr. Marquette, I was just talking. That's a three-story <laughs> drop. Well, Marquette. that don't mean a thing to a real wire walker. Sorry, no bet. No bet. Well, what about it, Dooley? Wouldn't you like to make a hundred dollars? Well, yeah, but I think but maybe you're it's you're scared, my... ain't you? Because you're no acrobat. <laughs> I bet you was nothing but a trained monkey on a string for that circus. <laughs> hey, somebody throw him a peanut. Come on, Julie, let's get out of here. Uh, no, no, wait a minute. Mr. Marquette, I accept your challenge. Will you stake me, Mr. Paladin? No, Dooley, you'd be risking your life. I gotta do it, Rena, don't you see? How about it, Paladin? You gonna stake him? You asking a man to risk his life for just a hundred dollars? Well, all right, I'll raise the ante. Thousand dollars. Your price is a little high, Marquette. You must be pretty anxious to see Dooley put his life in jeopardy. Shut up. Or shut up. Not for a thousand dollars. Make it two thousand. And Paladin, you're on two thousand dollars. You still willing, Dooley? Yes, sir. I'll do the best I know how. When the Declaration of Independence was signed on July 4th, 1776, eight of the signers were of foreign birth. Robert Morris was born in England, James Wilson and John Witherspoon in Scotland, James Smith, Matthew Thornton, and George Taylor in Ireland, and Francis Lewis in Wales. These men made outstanding contributions to the development of our country. The fact that they were born in other lands made no difference to their comrades. Today, one out of every five Americans is foreign-born or of foreign-born parents. The concept of judging men as men, not in terms of their origin, prevails today as in 1776. America's foreign-born citizens work with their countrymen for a better America. From the contributions of the past come the principles of the present. It was set for nine o'clock the next morning. Dooley, Delaware, was to walk a wire across the main street of Salamander City. I left the saloon early and went to my hotel room to get a much-needed night's rest, but I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about the little acrobat who had to prove to Marquette and the people of the town that he wasn't a monkey on a string. And he had to prove it for Rena's sake. I knew she was Irene Stanford, and my job was to take her back to her father in San Francisco, but that would have to wait. About midnight, I decided to get up and dress and join the crowd at the saloon, which I knew would still be celebrating the big event scheduled for the next morning. Mr. Paladin? Rena. Thank goodness you're still up. Oh, so what's the matter? It's Dooley. You come with me to his room? Well, sure. There's something wrong? He's drunk. Dead drunk. Those fools over there kept giving him whiskey until he wasn't able to stand up. I tried to stop him, but he wouldn't listen. He had to show him he could hold his whiskey with the rest of them. Was Marquette still there? Yeah, he bought all the drinks. Uh, and figures, protecting his investment. Here. When he got to the room, he just fell over on the bed. What can we do for him? Go downstairs and get a pot of coffee, Rena. Yeah, I don't think coffee will do him any good now. Well, it'll help. There's one thing for sure. He won't be in any shape to walk that wire in the morning. Oh, he'll be in shape if I have to pump coffee into him all night. No. I don't want him hurt. I love this little guy. I'm not going to let him do it. I'm sorry about your money, Paladin, but that's the way it's going to be. Look, Rena, if Dooley doesn't show up in the morning, they'll laugh him right out of town. I don't care. We're going to leave anyway. You may not care, but Dooley will. He'll never leave with you unless he can prove to himself that he's worthy of your love. It's something a man like Dooley just has to do. Now, go on, Rena. Go get the coffee. I poured two pots of coffee into Dooley while Rena kept wet cloths on his head. Finally, he told us the room had stopped going round and round, and I made him lie down and try to get some sleep. The next morning, he seemed to be all right. By nine o'clock, the crowd had gathered on Main Street, and the wire had been strung up between the hotel and the saloon. Rena, join me on the street to watch your little man do or die for his honor and my $2,000. We stood close to Marquette and Bolo to make sure they didn't have any last-minute shenanigans up their sleeves. 
Well, Paladin, seen you checking that wire out with Dooley. What's the matter? Don't you trust us? Not after last night. Yeah, you boy got a little drunk, didn't he? Yeah. Yes, he did, thanks to you. Well, you don't think It was I a good would... try, Marquette, but Dooley's all right this morning. Well, then we ought to get a good performance of the little monkey. We'll see. Mr. Paladin. Yes, Rena. I don't know whether I can look at him or not. Well, you better. Dooley'd be disappointed if you didn't see this. I will, Dooley. You'll do real good. Paladin. Keep your fingers crossed, Rena. There he goes. Paladin, he stopped. Dooley! What's the trouble? Are you all right? Sure, I'm fine. Clip right in the middle of the wire. Yes, I saw it. I said to the other side. That Dooley, whirling a complete turn right up there in the middle of nowhere. Did you see that, Mr. Marquette? Mr. Marquette. Uh, hey, he's gone. Where? I don't know. But he'd better have the two thousand dollars when I find him. Say, let me put a question to you. How much do you appreciate the things that make life just a little easier? Like living any place you've, you've a mind to. Now, according to our Constitution, if we don't like where we live, we can move to any other state we want to. All we have to do is hop in our car or take a train or a plane, and off we go. And when we get where we're going, there's plenty of stores and shops and tradesmen to help us in our new home. But let's go back a spell to 1790 and see what happened then when folks got the urge to move. If you were living back then, you'd maybe pick up a copy of the Providence Gazette, and you read an article called Advice to American Farmers. It tells all about moving out west, which is western Pennsylvania and Ohio in 1790. It says if you're moving, you'd better take along some apple, peach, and garden seeds, a kettle for boiling, maple sap, and, of course, a gun and plenty of ammunition. You should also have a Bible. Other folks moving west in 1790 took along maple saplings to plant or homemade tools they could use to build boats when they got there. Boats were about as important as horses in 1790. Most of the towns were built inside a fort since the Indians didn't specially like all this pioneering that was going on, and guns and ammunition were worked overtime. And Indians weren't the only ones who gave folks trouble. There was plenty of bear and wolves and other wild animals to keep folks on their toes. But somehow, in spite of all the fuss and bother of moving into a new community, folks in 1790 didn't complain. They just kept working and fighting, so living would be easier in the future. The future you're now protecting. <laughs> Marquette had disappeared. Someone told me they'd seen him go into his office down the street. I left the crowd celebrating their new hero and ran down to Marquette's office. He wasn't there. I started to look out the back door when I heard the floor creak behind me. Hey? That's one way to stop having to pay off a bet, Marquette. Shoot the winner in the back. Dirty pig. Shoot a hole in my hand. You're lucky it wasn't your head. Get me to a doctor. Look at the blood. You'll live. Get your own doctor. But first, I want the $2,000 you owe me. Well, that was no fair bet. You knew that monkey was a professional wire walker. I didn't know any more than you. You raised the ante. I had the faith he could do it. You was in on it together. Planned it from the start. You think what you want, but give me the money. No, sir. I'll, I'll put a hole through the other hand, Marquette. Yeah, all right. Come stomping into my town. Rigging up a shore bet. And... Here. There's $2,000. Now, go on, get out of my town and take your mother, too, with you. We'll be leaving on the next stage. It'll be good to breathe some clean air for a change. Are you sure you won't change your mind, Rena? The stage goes all the way to San Francisco. No. Dooley and I are still getting off the next town. I hear the circus is still there. Uh-huh. 
Well, your father will be disappointed. I know. But he's got to understand that his daughter has to make her own way. When he does, I'll come back and visit him. Rena and I are going to be married, Mr. Paladin. Congratulations, Dooley. I'm going to join Barnum again. They'll pay good money when I show them that Dooley Delaware is still king of the wire walkers. <laughs> Yeah, Rena won't ever have to work in a saloon again. Her father will be glad to hear that, Dooley. Oh, by the way, here is your share of the bet, $1,000. It'll give you a good start. Oh, you don't have to give us that. It was your money you staked him with. I know, but I'm still $1,000 for the good. That'll make up for the fee I won't be getting from your father. Oh, Mr. Paladin, I... Oh, thank you. For everything. Forget it, Dooley. You just take good care of Rena. Oh, oh. Mr. Paladin. Hello, Miss Wong. Welcome home. I was just cleaning your room. Does hey boy bring you bags up? He'll be up in a few minutes. In there are some minutes. new guests down at the desk. Oh, I told him to take care of them first. You go on not so long trip this time. No, not so no, long. No, not so long. The stage ride was hot and dusty. Oh, dusty. I feel like I've been gone for a week. Hey boy tells me all about you, and he, you bring back girls? Hey boy talks too much and hears too much. Oh, hey boy. Why don't you tell him it's a very bad, bad habit, Miss Oh, Wong. no, Mr. Paladin. Hey boy knows it yet, uh -huh. but I like <laughs> Maybe you like to? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Miss Wong. Miss Wong. I like to. Have gun, will travel. <laughs> Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe, is produced and directed in Hollywood by Frank Paris and stars John Daner as Paladin, with Ben Wright as Hey Boy and Virginia Gregg as Miss Wong. Tonight's story was written by Don Brinkley and adapted for radio by Alan Sloan. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards, Lawrence Dobkin, James Nusser, and Peggy Weber. Gun Will Travel is brought to you through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.